Hey everyone, welcome to another LinkedIn Live series from Tribal Impact on, on Let's Go. We're focusing on social advocacy um, and how to uh, improve your personal brand mm -hmm. and enhance your social influence um, on channels like LinkedIn, you know, Twitter, YouTube, you know, even TikTok for B2B potentially. Um, but I'm delighted to say that today we're joined by uh, Jeff Winter, industry executive uh, in the manufacturing industry for Microsoft. Um, and you know, you've had an amazing journey through social media, Jeff. So a very warm welcome and it would be great to um, hear you introduce yourself and to talk a bit about you know, some of the sort of social media journey that you've been on, especially over the past couple of years and, and get, get right to it. Sure. Uh, like I said, my name is Jeff Winter and I am an industry executive for manufacturing with Microsoft, which basically means it's my job to help US, US based manufacturers digitally transform at scale. But in order to be successful at that role, I have to be very involved within the industry to know what's happening. I need to know trends, statistics, best practices. And that's why I'm a part of so many different industry groups, advisory boards, academic teams, uh, and active on social media to help have that information to help people out there in their digital transformation journey. Now, related to the social media side, my previous role that I had before Microsoft um, was for a smaller company where I actually helped lead the marketing and business strategy efforts. And that's where I made the concerted effort for me as an individual and for the company to be more active on social media directly as a result of the pandemic. So my social media journey started actually in about February of 2021. It's fairly recent. It is. And I, I've got to pick on that because I was just looking before um, we started to talk to you, Jeff, I was looking at your statistics because there's some there's something pinned on your profile that people can go and have a look at your LinkedIn journey. And I, I have to laugh because in 2020, you put number of posts shared one. <laughs> No, I got had... one share of my posts. Oh, did you? Oh, that, one share. That means that of all my posts for the year, I got one share. One share. And you had 871 followers. And then you fast forward one year, you've got 13,691 followers. That was 2021. I'm sure you've got latest stats now. But this is an incredible growth journey. What what happened? How did that? How did, Can you describe a little bit about how that happened? Sure, there's a whole bunch to, to unpack with that. So I made a very concerted effort that started in February to leverage social media. And the main reason why I chose to do that, and I wrote about this uh, in that document, is because we were in kind of the, the height of the pandemic and everyone was working from home. And I realized that you can't do much if you don't have a digital presence when everyone's working from home. You're not going to events, you're not going to conferences, you're not meeting people, you're not doing anything to expand your awareness and your individual communications and connections with people unless you're doing it online. So I saw the immediate need to be more active on social media. Then I started to look at statistics and found that all social media increased dramatically during that time, but LinkedIn especially increased more than the other social platforms. And my personal thought is why, I may be wrong, but this is my personal thought, is because for the business world, not just the personal world, but for the business world, people just felt more comfortable being on LinkedIn during the day than on Facebook or Instagram or TikTok because it's more business related. It's related to your job. Um, and then I found out that the two main reasons that people were going to LinkedIn was because of educational content and to network. And so I took advantage of people wanting educational content and people wanting to network and just exploited it. So I made a very concerted effort to be active on LinkedIn for two purposes. One was posting to share educational content and two is networking, which is sending messages and getting to know people as, result, you know, as part of it. And that just whoosh, took off. Um, and yeah, my 2021 stats are now pretty small compared to where they're at in 2022. Yes. Do you want to give it what are your followers now then? So in 21, they were 13,000. So I think uh, I, I'm at like 31,300 followers now. Uh, I ended 2021 at 1.9 million views uh, on post, which 2020 was 16,000. So 1.9 million. And as of today, I'm at 6.7 million. Um, and we're just August. I'll probably end the year around 10, 10 11 million uh, views. Goodness gracious. And, and what uh, I think, yeah, sorry, go ahead, 
No, I was just going to say what's amazing about this is this mm. the speed. It's the, it's the speed to do this. A lot of people are taking a lot of time. Mm. I didn't have a question. Sorry, Tim, but it was just an observation. So. Yeah, no, but you've obviously been very intentional with your with your strategy. And so can you can you talk us a bit more about how you because you've obviously got that networking and educational content. But you know, what, what, what was your routine like? What did you how did you how did you consume information and decide what to share and you know, who to network with? You know, could you go into more detail? Because as Sarah said, it's a meteoric rise from, you know, hardly anything to 31,000 and you're getting some serious engagement on your posts, you know, maybe an average engagement of around sort of 600 um, you know, interactions on individual posts, which could be individually seen by what, 30 or 40,000 people. So it's pretty impressive. It would be great to unpick that a bit more. Sure. So part of, uh, let's start with why I selected LinkedIn and then what my strategy was as a part of it. So the main reason why I picked LinkedIn over any other platform is because I get to control or have a controlling mechanism over who I actually am connected with. So you can't do that in other platforms. If I, my audience, for example, is manufacturing, that's my entire career has been manufacturing. So I would look for people in manufacturers that uh, would focus on digital transformation or industry 4.0. How can you search for those people on other platforms? You really can't, but I can search for people um, in LinkedIn that would focus on the same topics that I would be you know, talking about. So my, you know, following 31,000 is large for LinkedIn, but it's nothing for TikTok or Instagram and these others, but those could be, you know, kids and people that don't matter. My following is mostly people in my space that would be executives within manufacturing. In fact, if you look at my statistics, 12% of all my views are manufacturing executives. So that just shows you the, the um, people that are seeing and engaging with what I do is the audience that I, I targeted. It's not, I'm not trying to just gain followers for followers sake. I'm trying to get followers within a very specific area that are interested in what I talk about. Cause I learn as much from them as they actually do from me. So back to the strategy uh, part. So the first thing that I uh, looked at was my brand. So this goes back to COVID uh, forcing the need for digital brand rather than just brand in general. Whatever shows up online is really how you're known as a result of COVID because you weren't doing things in person. So I focused on a digital brand, which really answers three main questions that I came up with. One, what do I want to be known for? Which are the topics? And everyone would need to pick their topic or topics that they want to be known for. In my case, it's digital transformation, industry 4.0, IoT, AI, and manufacturing. And I state that right on my profile. Those are the, the topics I talk about. Then you need to answer what are your skills? What is it you want to be known as being good at doing? Public speaking, strategy formulation, whatever you want to pick. It could be architecture. It could be whatever it is. And then third would be your identity, which is how do you as a person want to be known? For me, for example, it's fun and approachable, which is why I dress up in costumes and why I respond to comments, because those are part of the identity that I'm looking for. Once you develop your brand that you have, then the big thing that you need to decide is do you want to be a subject matter expert or a thought leader? And the way that I differentiate the two is a subject matter expert knows what they're talking about, but isn't pushing it out there in the industry. The thought leader is pushing it out in the industry. So the big difference is you know, push versus react is part of it. So the react, the subject matter expertise is about updating your profile to be a collection of everything that you want to represent for your brand. Because as statistics will show as a result of the pandemic, people get looked up about eight times more than they used to before. So are you representing what you want when people look you up? So what you show on your profile is very important for the subject matter expertise that you want to convey that is a reflection of your brand. Then there is the thought leadership, which is pushing it out in the industry as part of it. And there's more. That's a bigger task. I estimate that you know only 5% of people can or should or want to be thought leaders, but everyone should be a subject matter expert in something. I don't care if you're a salesperson, an engineer, a marketer, you need to be a subject matter expert in something as a part of it. So I developed a thought leadership strategy and that thought leadership strategy was around five main areas. It's, it's around credentials. Do you actually have the letters behind your name that says you know what you're talking about? Accolades, recognition, 
groups like you, others out there that actually state that you are recognized by peers in your industry as being good at what you do. Third is developing a network. Fourth is being an ambassador, being out there in, this, in the industry, involved in associations, groups, and, and helping to advance the industry. And the last uh, influence is putting your opinion out there, speaking, writing, and doing stuff, uh, you know, posting as a part of it to, to actually put your opinion out there. That is the thought leadership strategy I developed. LinkedIn only became the promotional tool of it. So a lot of people look and they, they immediately want to start with LinkedIn. And I look and I go, I would rather you start with your subject matter expertise and your thought leadership. And then it makes your LinkedIn uh, specific tactics and strategies simpler. Because a lot of people ask, well, how much time do you spend on posts? And I would argue that some of them I don't spend much time on. What I spent time on was my thought leadership, speaking at a conference, writing an article. But then what I do is I take that article, take that speech, just turn it into a post. So the post became really easy. The actual speech is what took time, but I can turn a speech into eight different posts. So that's kind of the, the overarching strategy that I would look at for kind of how I approach this. And then I made a very <clears throat> specific routine, which we can get into next, like what I do on a, on a daily basis and how I kind of make that work over time. Yeah. What do you that, want, what do you oh, want I think do? that's, I think what you've done there is you set the scene and you're sort of chunking it down. And I am, I'm waiting to hear what your routine is. <laughs> what, what practically, how do you put that into, you know, into action? Sure. And once again, there is a separate, what I would uh, define as like a LinkedIn specific strategy, but I'll just kind of walk you through my routine to start. And this has been refined over time. It didn't start this way. You can't say that, hey, in February of last year when I started, this is what I did. No, I've kind of figured this out. So <clears throat> 7 to 8 a.m. is typically my dedicated LinkedIn time. Sometimes it's less, sometimes it's a little bit more. Uh, that's when I accept- Is, that, is my... that 7 to 8 a.m. Eastern time? My time, or... Central time. That's just when it's I- Central time. That, Central that's just time. my daily routine. I kind of view it as 8 to 5 is my standard work day when I do my- you know, my main job function, this like before I start my day is kind of when I, I do my LinkedIn stuff. That's my time. So if you think of me as more of like even a, a, a mega influencer and to go, I only spend this much time. I encourage that others, when you start, you need to spend less or you uh, only need to spend less. So seven to eight is my kind of dedicated uh, LinkedIn time. That's when I accept my connection requests, which right now, you know, I get 50 to 100 connection requests a day. I comment on posts, I prepare my posts, and I respond to messages that I got throughout the, the day uh, as part of my account. The rest of my day, I mainly use LinkedIn as a chat app and respond when needed uh, uh, throughout my, my day. Oftentimes, I do have LinkedIn open, and it's mainly just in case people message me or I message them as a part of it. So we'll kind of get over in terms of the specific practices, there's, there's four areas that I kind of have practices on and we'll, we'll get into each of them. First is posting. Second is commenting. Third is connect, uh, connecting and accepting um, uh, requests. And fourth is the chat feature. So if we start with posting, I like to try and post four to five times a week. But that's, that's me now, a year and a half into it. When I started, which I show you in those stats, I started with once a week. And then I slowly worked up <clears throat> over time to get to four to five times a week once I became much more effective at doing it quickly. I typically post 8 to, to 10 a.m. local time because I found out statistically that's the best time to post. So I usually have a post ready to go and then I just hit submit during that time. Like for example, I have a post ready to go now. As soon as we're done with this call, I'm gonna hit post, but it's all ready to go. Um, I have a strategy for how I actually decide what I post on. So about 80% of my posts are around the knowledge topics that I talked about, my five uh, knowledge topics. And about 20% of my posts are about me personally, my life, my accomplishments. Because one of the things that makes a person so effective versus a company or brand is that connection. So if you never get to learn anything about me, you don't feel close to me or anything about Jeff. It's just about my subjects. So about 20%, like I said, is about me. <clears throat> then if you look at a different way, about 50% of my posts are original and 50% are shared. So if you look at that, it takes the burden down of how many you're, you're coming up with on your own versus how many you just found that were interesting and then you reshare them for, for what you're doing. So that's posts. Commenting. 
So I have three groups I regularly comment on as a part of it. I have influencers, other influencers. I have CEOs and other leaders at companies that are within my space, which is manufacturing. And then I have, I'm just going to call them industry friends. So the reason why I chose these influencers is a good example where you can ride people's waves. And most people don't realize that I did this a lot last year and now people are starting to do it to me. So for example, I average about 40, let's look here, 42,400 uh, views per post that I make is what I have is my current average right now. If you comment on my post, that is up to 42,000 people that can see your comment on my post, assuming you're the first person to, to comment on that. That's huge increase in awareness to you, the commenter, riding my wave of my post. I did that last year to a lot of other people, and I still do it this year, where I will comment on other influencers' posts, not for them to respond back, but because of how many people will see my comments. So it's very strategic on who I choose that aligns with my, um, my industry and my talking points. Second is CEOs and other uh, leaders in the industry. So for example, if I have a client, let's take one of the you know large companies in the world, their CEOs post all the time, whether it's them themselves or their social media manager, they're posting all the time. So I comment on their posts. I don't get the CEOs to comment back, but I know that their employees see their own CEOs posts. So they're going to see my comment. And that absolutely is, has been true where people have mentioned, Hey, I saw your comment on my CEOs post. And then the third is industry friends, just people I developed rapports with in the industry and just kind of like their stuff and, and help support them. So that's kind of my my commenting strategy. Um, and then third, I said was uh, connecting and accepting requests. So I accept most connections, but I unfollow a lot of them, especially if they don't send messages or don't engage or, uh, you know, they don't do anything with me. I unfollow them because otherwise I'll have tens of thousands of people showing up in my feed that, you know, I, I don't have any connection with. And usually over time, I may follow more depending on if they engage or talk to me at all. Um, the other thing I've developed too is I have three canned messages ready to go so that I don't have to spend a lot of time um, when people send me connection requests. I have one that just thanks for the invite and here's what I expect. I have one that is specifically a response for when people ask to meet with me because I get 11 to 18 meeting requests a day from people who go, I just want to meet and talk. There's no way I can do all that. And then the third one I have is for job requests. I have no idea why, but I get about an average of five job requests a day. Can you help me get a job? Uh, so I have those kind of pre-canned responses, so I take no time with them. And the last is the chat feature that I mentioned. So I made a conscious effort to use the LinkedIn chat feature as my primary communication tool with everyone, people within Microsoft, people, uh, partners, customers, and anyone new that I'm meeting for the first time, I still use Teams and I still use, you know, email, but those are kind of have different purposes. But my primary uh, communication function is LinkedIn. If I'm in a new meeting with people, I send everyone a connection request and I send a message of nice to meet you. If it's a client, I typically will follow up with them with a LinkedIn message. If it's a PDF to send or something to, to give them, I'll send it in LinkedIn. And the main reason I do that, even with coworkers at Microsoft, is because if you just meet someone in a meeting, and then you send them an email, they don't know anything about you except what they remember in that meeting. If you send the exact same message in LinkedIn, they get to see your profile and you control your brand with your profile. They may go, oh, I didn't know you were part of this board or you went to this school or you spoke on this subject last week. You get to control your brand. So I have much more control of my brand by messaging through LinkedIn than I do through any other communication means. So that there's kind of a summary of my practices and uh, and routine. Wow, yeah, <laughs> I, I think I think Sarah would probably agree with me. There's there's Sarah and I have interviewed probably about you know fifty or so, or it feels like fifty. I don't know how many. It's you know people who are you know, seriously influential on social, but I think not once have we heard a framework which is so organized and professional. And I, w I guess I was going to ask a personal question. What, what kind, you're very, are you very organized or what kind of personality traits do you think um, you have? Because not everyone can, can be as 
focused and strategic as as you, even if they want to be, I think? Uh, I, it's a good question. Other people would have to tell me what my personality traits are instead of what uh, what I may think they are. I mean, generally, I love the challenge of figuring things out that I'm passionate about. This was something that I saw the future direction and I made a concerted effort to, to figure it out. And some of it I learned on my own. Part of it, it may be my personality. It may just be the practice of reaching out to other people. I reached out to other influencers and asked them. I reached out to people that specifically do LinkedIn marketing for a living to ask them, you know, help. And so I kind of developed my own strategy over time. So yes, it looks like I'm very organized, know what I'm doing, but I did not start out day one with this. I started out day one going, what the heck do I post about? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I think, you know, we've had some comments coming in. Adam said, wow, this is an inspirational session <laughs> right out of the gates, Jeff. Thank you. Um, getting very excited for advocacy and developing my personal brand. Uh, Shishting, uh, Steve, I'm just going to say because I said that wrong. Interesting. Never think about posting except about knowledge. Love this breakdown. Jeff Winter said Sam Langto. So thank you very much. Yeah, brilliant. Um, I've just written so many notes down here but one thing I wanted to you've kind of touched on it already a little bit Jeff you said you know I'm interested to know what motivates you to post and right at the very start when you said you started this program you said something about it's about learning it wasn't just about posting you don't didn't go into it with a I'm going to post I just want a place where I can learn and connect um so I, I guess I've answered a bit of your question but there might be other bits there as well what motivates you Well, there's a whole bunch of things that motivate me for different reasons, but specifically for this, um, and I'm going to, I'm going to talk about the LinkedIn side, not necessarily the, uh, the, the thought leadership side, but the LinkedIn side, honestly, the recognition is fun. I like it. I, I enjoy when people, uh, like what I do and recognize me as a leader in the space. That part, that part's fun. It's not my driving factor, but it, it is fun and it keeps me kind of going I mean, if no one in, in engaged at all, if I got zero likes and zero comments on every post, I, I don't know that I would keep doing this. Um, but the, the two big uh, other driving factors I'd say, one is networking and meeting like-minded people. Uh, that's just like-minded people that want to be other influencers, like-minded people that like my topics, and then we can just meet and chat about them. So I've now met quite a few um, different clients as a result of this. Or one of my favorite things I have is when I join a meeting to be introduced to a new client, the very first thing they say is, I already follow you and I like your content. Like that's just, that's exciting for me uh, as part of it. Um, the, The third thing, and this is kind of two components, it's learning. So what most people don't realize is I learn a lot by making my post on two reasons. One is it forces me to have to simplify a message to make the post. And in doing that, I um, I inherently become better at storytelling because I have to simplify messages in short amount of words, whether I have to come up with a quote, whether I have to come up with the, the five, like I just did a post that was my most successful of all time was the uh, on my KPIs. And I came up with the five biggest mistakes of KPIs. Coming up with those five mistakes took me a little bit, but now that I have them, I can rattle them off anytime I want because I thought through that. So when I now go meet in front of people or speak at a place, I've got a lot more um, quick ability to talk, quick things to talk about ready to go because I made those posts because I spent the time to have to figure out what are those five sentences I want to say on this. Even something as simple as, Jeff, what's your definition of digital transformation? Probably took me 30 minutes to come up with a good one for a post, but now I have it ready to go is is an example of coming up with that. The second component of that learning is I learn just as much from my posts as others do because I get lots of comments. I average, uh, let's see here, 106 comments per post. So that's a lot of comments and I try and respond to almost every one and the ones that are usually meaningful are the ones where people share their opinion or ask a question and that gets me to learn the subject better. Either they ask a question I don't know and I got to look it up or they say something that gets me to think entirely differently about it and I walk away learning more from some of these other experts, remember targeted people that I have in the industry. So I enjoy engaging with the comments because I learn. I love that. Yeah. And, and, and I... And I was going to ask you as a follow up to that, what are the what, what are the best of personal um, accomplishments that you've had through LinkedIn? If you can 
reel off a few anecdotes. I mean, what 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 achievements have you had, or sort of moments where you've been particularly proud through your posting? Um, sure. So there's there's been a couple. Um, one is the industry recognition. I've been picked up by six different uh, groups recognizing me as top people in the industry so far this year on topics. And I know that wouldn't be possible without my social presence. Now, what gives me the credibility is my thought leadership. What gives me the influence is LinkedIn. And so that's kind of how I define the difference between uh, if I were to break it up into, uh, if you were to look at this diagram, I'm gonna make a post on this in the near future, is if you look at subject matter expertise knows a lot, but isn't uh, promoting out in the industry. A influencer doesn't know a lot, but has a huge audience. A thought leader is combining both of them. Mm -hmm. It's going, you have a big following and you also have the credibility. So the industry recognition wouldn't be possible without both of those. I view it because you can get popular on Instagram or TikTok posting cat videos, but you're not an authority <laughs> on a subject. And that's what I want to be as an authority on a subject and have a, a good following. So industry recognition is a driver for me. It's a motivator when people recognize me for things as part of that. It's, it's fun. Uh, requesting to speak, be interviewed or write is another thing that I would use an accomplishment. I get asked um, three to five times a week now to speak at places uh, or be interviewed and another one or two times to write. Um, that's probably my guess at my average. And that's, that's a, a recognition that I like. The other thing that uh, I think is a personal accomplishment is the fact that um, when you join a company like Microsoft, for example, and you get uh, connected to their LinkedIn, every company can have this. Uh, when you sign up for the social, um, the sales navigator, sorry, you get an SSI score, social selling index as a part of it. And it compares you to everyone in your company. So you can see how well you do compared to everyone in your company. And I'm excited that as of last week, I became number one. So I'm number one in Microsoft uh, for figuring out how to leverage um, LinkedIn from a social selling uh, side, which is different than influence. And so that's kind of a personal accomplishment that doesn't matter to anyone but me. But that <laughs> is directly related to my uh, use on LinkedIn. I do like when um, companies call me up. I probably had five companies ask me to help train them. I've had uh, executives and companies ask me to help coach them uh, on their their branding and their presence. Um, and that's that's kind of exciting that people recognize it, especially if people that are two or three levels higher than me in organizations and go, I need your help. <laughs> I just, uh, there was something you said there about your credibility comes through the thought leadership that you do yeah. and your influence comes through LinkedIn. But then touching on what you also just said, your inspiration actually comes from your community as well, you know, through the comments that they leave yes. and, you know, it That's helps a good you way of putting it. My inspiration comes from the community. Mm, like so that. the more you've done this, the more there's a little one to add to your content that you do around it. Actually, there's a co there's a comment that's just come in here, which actually ties into the co the question I was going to ask. So really helpful breakdown, Jeff. How do you keep coming up with new content if you're posting four to five times a day? Is no, it not four to five times a day. Four to five uh, times no, a day. Four to, yeah, no, they did say that. Actually, I read it wrong. Four to five, <laughs> yeah, posted. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, day. No, it's not. Just trying, it to, trying, to <laughs> trying to multitask in the heat, Sarah. Yeah, I know. Well, it's very hot. So, yeah. uh, good question. And sometimes it's harder, sometimes it's not. Uh, but if you look at and go, roughly half of my content is shared, how I'm defining shared. I still always add my opinion or comment to it, but those don't take me long to make those posts. If I find a new HBR article or an article from a magazine and add my two cents to it. And then the ones that take longer are the my original ones, where it's a, a graphic that I make that I have my logo at the bottom that I put on there. Because some of those graphics can take um, can take a while, and some of them I work on in my mind and you know over time, and then and then make them. Like the uh, the format supply chain video, I'm gonna admit that one probably took me three hours to make. I mean, that's about the most amount of time I've ever spent on a post. It probably took me three hours to make, and I didn't when I sat down know that that would take three hours, and then I was committed to it. I'm like, I gotta finish this. So um, th some of them, uh, you know, I will post a poll. Those polls usually occur the days that I don't know what I'm going to post. I'm like, oh, I've got six <laughs> minutes to make a post. I'm going to make a poll. All right. So there's sometimes that I just don't have a lot of time, like, but I got to get something out. So I'm going to put a, a poll out. Um, the other thing I started doing this year is I try and make one out of every five posts an actual reshare of my own post. 
because I've realized that if you started following me now, I've gained 15,000 followers this year. That means you didn't see my stuff last year. All right. And my statistics show that my reposts are doing about five times better than my original post because my first post last year, chances are no one's seen it. I mean, I showed it looked 1000 people saw it. So that is not a lot. So I re I, I typically reshare those and uh, it shows that new audiences, new people engage with it. So when you factor in the fact that I'm sharing others, I'm reusing some of my own, that only leads me to about two or three posts a week that I'm actually generally created. I follow different groups and I'm a part of a lot of stuff for industry thought leadership so that I have stuff ready to go. Like my post today is gonna to be one about a new Microsoft uh, research that came out. Well, I was involved in that research as an example. So it makes it very easy for me to make a post on that on that research that's, that's coming out. So once again, if you get back to you do thought leadership, your posts become easy. When I do an interview panel discussion, there's five questions that get asked of me for, you know, what's the latest in industry 4.0? And I spend a little time answering that. It's a great post right there. That post takes no time because I spent all the time making that answer to that podcast. So this took me a while to figure out, but I've become very efficient at making posts with not much time. Like I said, for me being a mega user, one hour at most I spend uh, on this a day. Sometimes it's 15 minutes. I, I, th I think what I think what you do so well, Jeff, is because it's a continuous thought process of I'm going to use LinkedIn to 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 become more of a thought leader, to become more of an influencer. Then you're constantly thinking about questions. I I, I think back to sometimes when I post quite frequently, it's pretty easy. And when I go through a period of two weeks not posting, it's actually quite hard to get back on it. But you've got the continuous thought process, when you're speaking at a panel or an event, you're like, how can I break this into a post? And so you're, I imagine writing notes where there are posts ready to go. You kind of back them up. I have, so this is a, this is how I manage my content flow. I use PowerPoint uh, as my medium. It's kind of funny because this wasn't intentional, but it works out that I work for Microsoft and PowerPoint's my tool. LinkedIn is the platform and Microsoft's the company I work for. But PowerPoint is where I collect all of my images. And what I do is I have a running tally of all my images that I put in there. And so whenever I'm at a conference or whenever I see something, whenever I see an article, I snapshot the image, put it in there and put the link uh, below it. And then when I get ready for a post, I probably have a hundred loaded in there that are starting points for me to go, all right, I need to make a post today. And oh yeah, that's a great picture. Let me read the article real quick. Uh, and then we'll make a post about, so it keeps getting bigger over time because I get new stuff all the time that I see. And so I have this running collection. So I don't have to go search for anything ever. Yeah, this is, oh, this is just so practical. We're getting loads of questions, Jeff, here, honestly. you got, uh, And I haven't even got on to the next one here, but somebody did say, um, what tools do you use for your LinkedIn analytics? Because a lot of people are, uh, you keep referring to your data. You're obviously watching your data and you measure your impact. And you know what works and what doesn't and what time to post. So what's the, what's behind that? This is the one I'm embarrassed about, oh. Excel. Okay. <laughs> I mean, I use Shield AI, Shield AI, but it doesn't give me the breakdown that I want based off of what I want. So each day I load my post in there and then uh, usually the next day I will update its numbers. But what I keep track of is my first hour statistics. So if you're to go, what do I load in there? I load my first hour statistics because that will give me a trajectory as to how well the post is going to do. And then some point later, I'll just load its, um, its current state. Like a week or so later, I'll load where it's at. And so I keep track of, uh, you know, shares, comments, likes. I separate out video views versus uh, impressions. And then I tag mine versus is it new? Is it reused? Is it shared? Uh, I tag the subjects to it. So if you were to go, Jeff, how many posts did you make on AI? I can look it up in, you know, 20 seconds and go, I've made 116 posts on AI. That's a made up number, but I can look that up really quickly to, to figure that out. So um it would suck to have to do that if you did it once for the whole year. But because I just, every time I make a post, I literally cop the link, copy the link, put it in. And then the next day I'll just load the numbers. It takes eight seconds. You know, it doesn't take a, a long time. And then just over time, I've got the graphs already made that will just, you know, organize it and aggregate it by averages by month and rolling averages so that I can, you know, tell you where I'm at. So I can so, just read it right now and just tell you all the statistics. So I, I love that. There's one other person that we had on that did the same thing, who is mm -hmm. focused on analytics. So Benjamin Arnold, I think his name is. Mm -hmm. um, 
where he does the same thing about putting it in an Excel with every single sort of detail of the post. And it seems, you know, over the top, but actually it's not too much work if you make that commitment and, and look at the analytics, you can, you can see what works and, and it's obviously working for you and for him. Uh, but it's just interesting that there's, there's been very few people that, that uh, have the, um, I think the aptitude or the actual inclination to do that. But if you do do that, then you're obviously serious about it. Yeah. And so I didn't start this, uh, tracking my posts until maybe 10 months in. Um, it wasn't until I started to finish last year and that took a little while to go back and load all of my posts and categorize them. I mean, that's where I took a couple hours for my very first time doing it and figure out what do I want to show? And I did it for my posts that I had on the analytics, but in 2022, it's taken no time because it's already there. I'm just at a line each, each day I make a post. And that just, it continues to, um, you know, add, add to it. And I even, you know, use the functions to do projections. Like I said, you know, my projected, uh, year forecast is 10,898,015 impressions. (laughs) I just, I I can tell you what the forecast is. So how do you, so, so because you've nailed it as an individual and I know you help others, how do you, how do you coach or what advice do you, I mean, obviously you talk through your framework when you're talking to other people, but not everyone has the, uh, some people don't have the time. Some people don't have the personality traits because I think you've got a lot of the entrepreneurial spirit and the analytical your know, foresight and the subject matter expertise. So a lot of people aren't where you're at. What are the typical sort of tips and advice that you tend to give others when they're coming to you? Um, look and say, hey, Jeff, but like, how do I do what you're doing? <laughs> well, the first thing is consistency is the key. And when people want my advice or coaching, uh, there's a couple of things I say. One, I'm not even really going to help you until I see you already make 20 posts. All right. Because that shows that you're actually consistent. I don't even care what your posts are. They could just be high. I don't care. I just want to show that you're doing it on a regular basis. The other thing is you're never going to see a one post person go viral. The people that post go viral, they've been posting already 50, 100 times, and then one goes viral as part of it. So a lot of people spend all this time and energy preparing their first perfect post. And I look at it and go, I, I don't even care about your first 20 posts. I don't care because they're not going to do well. I will fully tell you your first 20 posts are going to do bad because you're not in a consistent, uh, a consistent you know, kind of uh rut, I guess I would call it, uh, yet. And LinkedIn and all other social platforms reward consistency. And it actually does factor in for how your post will get more popular over time because they recognize, oh, you're continually active versus I posted once six months ago and then need to post once again today. So that would be things I would say is if you're serious, spend 15 minutes a day. I want you to make a post. I don't care if you just share an article. I don't care you need to get in the habit. Comment on five people's posts and you know, like uh, a handful of posts as well. I don't care what they are. I need to get you in the behavior of doing this every day. So this is one thing that I, I say to people too, is if you had one hour to spend on LinkedIn a week, I don't want one hour a day, a one hour for one day for the week. I want 10 minutes for six days. Yeah. Same hour, different way of engaging. And you need to get in that behavior of being very consistent rather than sitting down and going, I have one hour to spend. What can I do in that hour? And then you don't load LinkedIn for a week. You're going to miss out on all the engagement on everything. So do it small chunks frequently as part of it. The other advice I give is, once again, everyone needs to be a subject matter expert because you get looked up. You need to update your profile and reflect the brand that you want as a part of it. It'll help you personally and professionally. If you want to decide to be a thought leader, that's the next stepping stone. But your starting point is be a subject matter expert. Refine what your brand is, and then we can become a thought leader. Amazing. That is just so good. Oh, you've just shared so much pr- practical advice. We've had quite a lot of comments about this. Love the forethought on the approach, the content creation, tagging, measurement, Jeff. Thank you for sharing. Michael said that. Percy, great session, Jeff. If you had to start all over again in a new industry, would you build your knowledge base and following to a similar level? Probably applying the same techniques, I would think you would. So, yeah. I would think love- I would, yeah. 
Yeah, love the perspective from Macy of engaging with comments. So yeah, super stuff, Jeff. Honestly, I know when we're, we're nearly up on time, aren't we, Tim? But I yeah, I just I know. I mean, what what I think is great is because quite often Sarah uh, and I are, are really sort of thinking about the questions to get the real um, your inspiration. But I think you've just got the inspiration. You really like Sarah and I didn't need to be here because you had uh, <laughs> because you have the framework, you have all the advice, you have all the ideas, which is which is really inspiring because I think a lot of people start with nothing saying, how can I be a subject matter expert or a thought leader or an influencer like Jeff? I've, I, I'm just starting out. And I think what's really interesting is that you've achieved scale within two to three years. And 17 months to be specific. well. I, I, I thought I thought you would uh, I thought you would reduce that. Um, <laughs> but even but even if it's like two to three years, you know, for people that might not be as um, as prolific as you, I think that's something to shoot for for them um, because it's it's in the near near future rather than them thinking they would need to spend ten years um, doing that. So I think that's really really inspirational. I just have one very very last question. What what do you think you didn't do so well when you started? Um, what what would you have done differently over the past couple of years? That's a good question. Um, I would have found other people that were very successful earlier to try and learn from them. I found people, but that was months into what I was doing. Um, so I thought that I could figure this out more on my own and I'm confident over time I would have, but leveraging people who've already gone through it saves you so much time. People starting now watching this will learn and leverage what I wish I had, you know, when I started with this. So that would be one of the things that I would say is finding, finding that person or two that can help give you some guidance at the beginning, or even someone, if you don't talk to them, that you just kind of follow and and mirror some of the things that they're doing. So you're not trying to figure it out on, on your own. Uh, and then the other, uh, I spent like everyone way too much time on my first posts. My first post, if I were to go back and look at them, I think they're mediocre, but I probably spent four times the amount of time on my, uh, them than I do now. So not only do I spend more time, they're not as good. Um, <laughs> And that was one that probably just like everyone else, you sit down, you try and spend all this time with the perfect post. And now I look at it and go, it's, it's a numbers game. Like I got to get 200 posts out this year. I don't care about any one more than any other, generally speaking. Mm. Yeah. Great. Well, with that, with that, with that, that's, that's really, that's really insightful. So thank you so much. I don't know whether you have a last question, Sarah, or whether. No, no, I'm good. good. You've been so generous, uh, Jeff, in sharing your experiences. And so thank you for that. Um, it's welcome. been fabulous. So, and yeah, and thank you everyone for watching and all the wonderful questions and the comments. And you can go back and look at those in a second, Jeff, but might give you some more inspiration for your next post. So, <laughs> but yeah, thank you for your time. And, and for anyone else watching this, will be, I think this will be found on the resources pages of Analytica and Tribal Impact's website. So you can go back because there's so much information you'll want to go back and rewatch and listen again, I'm certain. So, yeah. Thank you so much, Jeff. Really enjoyed it. You're welcome. You too. Cheers, Jeff. Take care. Bye. Take care.